Hello, Katie Anna. Welcome to Champions of the Truth, your very own live call-in talk show dedicated to explaining and defending the Catholic faith. Coming to you on February the 2nd, uh, 2021. And if you're watching around 7 o'clock on Tuesday, that means uh, we're, you're watching live. And after we finish our opening prayers, we invite you to call in the number 337-366-8951 and then you'll press extension 1 and you'll get right through to our phone so we can discuss the great uh, things happening today, um, Christianity in general, Catholicism in particular. Ronnie, let's uh, open with a decade of the Divine Mercy, please. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. You expire, Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls, and the ocean of mercy opened up for the whole world. O font of life, unfathomable divine mercy, envelop the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a font of mercy for us, I trust, I trust in, in you. you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a font of mercy for us, I trust, I trust in, in you. you. O blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a font of mercy for us, I trust, I trust in, in you. you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trust pass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil amen hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy mary mother of god pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion have mercy on us and on the whole world holy god holy, holy mighty, mighty one, one holy immortal one, one have mercy on us and on the whole world holy god holy mighty one holy immortal one have mercy on us and on the whole world Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. And Ronnie, uh, I forgot to mention, we want to pray with the, the decade of the Divine Mercy that we just prayed, and especially the prayer to Our Lady of Prompt Succor for a, a friend of ours, uh, a young girl, 13 years old, from South Louisiana, Mallory, who they called us today, uh, begging everyone for prayers. She had an aneurysm, a brain aneurysm, and they had to airlift her to Baton Rouge. So uh, we want to pray that they uh, catch it in time and the good Lord heal her. Okay. Please. Our Lady of Prompt Succor, you are after Jesus, our only hope. 
O most holy virgin, whose merits have raised you high above angel choirs to the very throne of the eternal, and whose foot crushed the head of the infernal serpent, you are strong against the enemies of our salvation. O Mother of God, you are our mediatrix, most kind and loving. Hasten then to our help, and as you once saved your beloved city from ravaging flames, and our country from an alien foe, do now have pity on our misery, and obtain for us the graces we beg of you. Deliver us from the wiles of Satan, assist us in the many trials which beset our path in this valley of tears, and be to us truly Our Lady of Prompt Succor now, and especially at the hour of our death. O Mary, Mother of God, who amidst the tribulations of the world, watches over us and over the church of your Son, be to us and to the church truly Our Lady of Prompt Succor. Make haste to help us in all our necessities, that in this fleeting life you may be our help, and obtain for us here the particular favors we ask. Help us to gain life everlasting through the merits of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. In the name, name of the Father, and the Son, and the, Son, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for tuning in. It's Tuesday, February the 2nd, the Feast of the Presentation of Jesus. If we were saying the first joyful, the, if we were saying the joyful mysteries, that's the fourth joyful mystery. And uh, Ryan, let's talk a little bit about that. First, I want to point out the picture on the screen. That's Father Chris Alar. Uh, he's with a great group of priests, the Divine Mercy Priests, the Marians in, in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, they are, they're the ones who, Ronnie, you may not realize this, but their order published in English for the first time, Sister Faustina's uh, Divine Mercy, her, her, her memoirs, her notebook, mm -hmm. uh, back in the 1960s. It was amazing. She had these uh, visits from Jesus in 1939 and so forth, but it uh, took many years before they were translated accurately into English, and his, his uh, group is the one that translated it about 40, 50 years ago, something like that. Uh, so we're going to show you a lot of pictures of priests today. Part of the reason is because it's the Feast of the Presentation. We want to talk a little bit about why that's uh, beautiful. Uh, it's 40 days after Christmas is, the, is today. And, uh, and uh, we uh, celebrate when uh, Mary and Joseph took Jesus into the temple. There's Father Donald Calloway. He's a, a brother priest uh, to uh, Father Chris Alar, belongs to the same order, and he's written quite a few books. And this one he just wrote, A Consecration to St. Joseph, did a lot of research on it. Uh, you might be seeing it in bookstores and things like that. It's a great book. Um, in fact, I think that his uh, research for the book and his promotion of the book didn't uh, uh, played no small part in Pope Francis dedicating this year to St. Joseph, first time in the history of the church that's hmm. happened. Ronnie, let's first talk about the Feast of the Presentation. Uh, the reading that was at Mass today is that beautiful reading when uh, Jesus, when a, uh, Mary and Joseph bring the child Jesus to the temple to give him to the Lord. And um, uh, do you remember the Simeon and Anna? Uh, if you remember those details, uh, tell our viewers something about the the drama of that scene and what Simeon told. Um, yeah, uh, Simeon was apparently a devout uh, Jewish man, and he had been praying that he would see the Messiah. And this is one of those neat things. It's kind of like the, the revelation to the shepherds out in the field on, on Jesus' birth. Well, he got a revelation that the Messiah was coming into the temple. And, and so this, in response to this revelation, he goes to the temple to see the Messiah. And he sees the Messiah. And apparently he, he had prayed that before he died, could he just see the Messiah? And so he beholds the child and, and he says, uh, paraphrasing, God, thank you. I have seen the child. Now you can dismiss me in peace. I, I'm 
I'm satisfied, I'm ready to go, you can take me, but I've seen the Messiah, the salvation of Israel, and, and, and so you have this remarkable event where he, supernaturally he's told the Messiah is coming, you know, it's not like our day and age where you put it on Facebook or, you know, whatever, in no way of knowing unless it was revealed to him supernaturally, and it was, and so he shows up in the temple, and then he tells Mary that... Uh, well, he, tell, he blesses Mary and Joseph, yeah. and, and, it, and the, and the uh, gospel writer says that they were amazed at what he was saying to them yeah. about the child, yeah. and then... Well, he, 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 he turns he, to Mary. He turns to Mary and he says, this child will, will uh, is, re reveal thoughts of many. I, I forget says, the terminology uh, he used. He says, uh, this child is destined to be the rise and fall of many in Israel, okay. a sign that will be contradicted, yeah. or sometimes you'll see a sign that will be opposed. Mm -hmm. And then he turns to Mary, his mother, and says, the sword, A sword of sorrow. And your own soul, yeah. a sword, shall pierce, so that the thoughts of many hearts yeah. may be revealed. Yeah. And so this is a, a foretelling of the, the uh, passion of our Lord that Mary witnesses, uh, at least parts of it, and so that's that's one of these swords of sorrow. And you know we we talk about the uh, uh, the sorrowful uh, uh, the seven the sorrows. seven sorrows of Mary, the seven dolors, and that's just one uh, of them. That you know one is the fleeing to Israel and uh, to Egypt. I mean, and the death of Jesus, his his burial, and so forth, and. Uh, taking his body down from the cross. And, and so these are just, this just one of the seven sorrows, but he again had that supernatural uh, illumination where he could, he was given some insights into what they were to bear uh, as a result of being Jesus's parents. And so. Yeah, I'd like to back up a little bit also. And again, we're showing there's a father, Father uh, Delcom and Father uh, Jacob White in uh, Sacred Heart of Jesus, yeah. Oh, I'll remember. <laughs> um, in fact, he just got a new assignment. Uh, he's going to be moving in a, in a week uh, to get his own parish. He's associate pastor. And uh, Father White, I'll remember in a moment what his first <laughs> name is, I'm sorry. But the two great priests, they both give great homilies, in fact, uh, you can go online to shbroussard.org, S-H as in Sacred Heart, broussard.org, and look up the homilies that each of them have given over the last few weeks. They're really marvelous, uh, very, very rich in catechesis, and a, a lot of priests don't do that these days, and, and more and more of them are starting to and it's just wonderful. So I, you're going to see pictures, several pictures of priests. And I mention that because it's sort of connected to today, the, the Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph bringing the child Jesus to the temple. You know, Ronnie, last week we saw, we talked um, a lot about how important it is not only to keep the law of God, but to hold up God's name reverently. If the whole population treats God reverently, respects his holy name, where the law and particularly custom, but if not custom, the law prevents things like blasphemy and disrespecting the holy name of God, the holy name of Jesus, the holy name of Mary even. And but how important that is, because if you, if you keep God respected among the people, then the, the children grow up seeing what the adults value. And if they know the Ten Commandments, 
and they realize that everybody respects and reverences the Ten Commandments, then you don't have to have 50,000 laws to try to catch them doing bad things and locking them up for 10 or 15 or 20 years or the rest of their life. Far better to train them, inspire them to do good and holy and loving things. And the main way you do that is by holding up the name of God reverently. But another way, Ronnie, is the feast of today. Now there you see uh, two priests from Sacred Heart and a real treasure is Father Floyd Calais, Father Floyd Calais. Um, he's uh, he's a, just a great priest, and uh, there you see some brother brotherhood among priests. Uh, they're they're all great friends. It's just heartwarming to see that. And so, Ronnie, the uh, the point I wanted to make about the importance we discussed last week about holding up the holy name of God and making sure that it's treated with reverence. But imagine the feast that was written into the custom of the Jewish people that the firstborn son had to be brought to the temple and basically they would be given to the temple. Now, you could buy him back if if they had plenty of servants at the temple then they, you know, I suppose 95% of them they did not need. And so the family would buy them back for an offering. In the case of poor people, it was two turtle doves. That's how we kind of know that Mary and Joseph were either poor or what money they had, they frequently gave it away so that they were poor. Um, but they, they chose the offering of the poor, the two turtle doves, or two young pigeons. And, but the idea, Ronnie, imagine what a custom that was, that everybody had to bring the, force, the firstborn son to the temple, and if they needed the boy at the temple, then they would take him, and you'd do without the firstborn son. 95% of the time, as I said earlier, you would get him back. But imagine what a valuable training that was, that people understood that God deserved what they would regard as their biggest treasure, the firstborn son. And Mary and Joseph, of course, did this for them, and Jesus coming to his own house it's rich with a thousand <coughs> times more significance because he's going, they're giving him to his father's house and then they take him back home with him. But uh, anyway, it's just part of the same fabric, Ronnie, of how important it is for us to recover what it means to treat the things of God with reverence. Yes, uh, and I think... Uh maybe you were talking about off air, is that when we go to God's house, we want to go with reverent attire on. Uh, you know, it, it illustrates what's in our mind. It's, uh, it's our actions that often illustrate our beliefs. And we go to our Lord, our Maker, and our, our Savior, and our Judge. We want to go uh, dressed up and not uh, in casual clothes, uh, that would suggest nothing special there, mm -hmm. but instead we dress up because we are honoring uh, the person whose house we're entering. Mm -hmm. the, uh, back in the old days, they would say uh, uh, everybody had one nice suit, and that was your Sunday go to meeting clothes. Um, and uh, so people understood that. And that was often when there wasn't such good air conditioning right. in churches, but nevertheless people uh, put on their, their coats and ties and, and went anyhow. So it's a far cry today when uh, it's a uh, go casual, go as you please, and not many people dress up. There's another aspect to the Feast of the Presentation in the Temple that I absolutely love and it has to do with the what Simeon told. And there's also the prophetess Anna, 
who had the same kind of inspiration coming into the temple and she spoke uh, to everyone in the, that she met. Now it says that she lived, I think it was seven years with her husband and then till she was 84, uh, after her husband died, she lived in the temple praying and fasting. And usually, this is just a piece of trivia, but usually when you see paintings of this scene, they show Simeon and they show Jesus and Joseph and Mary and they'll show Anna and she's thin because mm -hmm. to illustrate the uh, fasting, yeah. the frequent fasting. And so here's this woman of great prayer and the good Lord gives her this uh, special gift of seeing the anointed of the Lord, the Messiah, and she spreads the news as well. In fact, I don't think there are many uh, instances of a person being called a prophetess, but in this case, uh, uh, they do, and she is. Uh, but Ronnie, what I particularly like about the reading that goes with the feast day today is what Simeon told when he turned to Mary, his mother, and said, your own soul a sword shall pierce so that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And I guess once a year when this, when this feast comes around or this reading comes around, I like to tell a story that uh, there's a beautiful picture of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Um, and when you see a picture of Mary's heart, you often see it with swords, uh, indicative of the seven swords of sorrow that Ronnie referred to, one of those swords is the prophecy of Simeon, the sword that she would be pierced with when she saw her son's heart pierced. Uh, you know, every mother out there, Ronnie, will tell you that uh, it hurt her as much or more uh, to, in her heart, that was this mystical piercing that uh, she witnessed her son being pierced and she could uh, do none other than to feel the pain in her spirit, in her heart. But Ronnie, I like to tell this story that happened in my own life. I, I grew up in the jewelry business and once I had the opportunity to make a monstrance made with many, many pearls, uh, about 600 pearls, uh, seven millimeter pearls, and the, uh, it took me months to make it, and some of the people that I work with, they uh, saw me working on it in the evening. I worked on it after hours in my own time. And, uh, uh, and one of my friends uh, said, I had two reactions from two different people. One of my friends said, boy, that sure could buy a lot of sandwiches for the poor. <laughs> and I never knew that he would harbor such a thought. And I told him, I said, you know who else said something like that? J who? Judas. He said exactly that. Um, and then yet I had the cleaning ladies when they would come back to where my office was, where I was working on it, and seeing that I was working on something holy, they would whisper mm -hmm. around where I was. And I'll never forget that because in, ne in, uh, in neither case would I have known on the one hand that these cleaning ladies were so reverent. Yeah. And on the other hand, that my friend was not as reverent. But it was this object that I had that was a holy thing that elicited from both of them the secrets of the heart. Mm. And I'm reminded every time I hear this reading of that. In this case, it's not a thing, but it's a person. It's a woman. It's his mother, it's Jesus' mother. And seeing her suffer causes something to reverberate in the hearts of people 
that just the suffering of a man would not do. I'm reminded also of the passion of the Christ. Uh, we saw it five times in the theater, and the first, the, the, uh, the premiere night, when uh, it was like the first night it was playing in town, the theater was packed, about half evangelical Protestants and half Catholics. And Ronnie, when the, uh, when the scene came, when Mary met her son Jesus, when he was being uh, uh, pushed down the Via Dolorosa, the, the, the road of suffering, and she ran to meet him, and the whole audience could see the mother suffering in this meeting. And it occurred to me that for many of the evangelical Protestants who generally speaking, theologically speaking, don't give much attention to the Blessed Virgin Mary at all. Sometimes they are respectful, sometimes not. Sometimes they'll say, Mary was a sinner just like the rest of us which is blasphemous, she was not, she was sinless. But then some evangelical Protestants will treat her with respect, they just don't give her much attention at all. They believe wrongly that attention to Mary takes away from attention to Jesus. But for the people in the crowded theater that night, when this meeting of mother and son occurred, you could see, I believe, for the first time, many of these evangelical Protestants, good people, but for the first time, you could hear the sniffles start. You could hear them start to cry. And some of them, for the first time, realized, oh my goodness, you know, they were saying to themselves, I'm a mother, and I know what I would feel like, and I never thought that Jesus' mother would have been feeling this like. And that was one of the great achievements of the film is to bring that to the forefront. And that also was part of God's plan. This scene of Mary beneath the cross, not flat out passed out, but standing with her son in solidarity and yet suffering unbelievably. And yet this scene, Jesus on the cross, scratched and bloodied, and bruised and murdered and tortured. Mary, not a scratch on her, yet all of these things she feels in her heart, in her soul, in her spirit. And it's both of those things, Ronnie, this twin, these twin, this, this twin gift, Jesus giving himself to his Father, the infinite gift of his humanity with his divinity to his Father, Mary, human, but she agreeing with and participating in this great drama, this is the scene, according to Simeon, that this is going to reveal the hearts of many. And, there, and this piercing of her soul would, would lay bare the secret thoughts. And, and God, Ronnie, God wants people to see themselves. And this is probably the most magnificent uh, tool that he would use, this, these persons, to crack open the hardest of hearts. You know, interesting you bring that up because I was thinking that the, we're now two weeks from the start of Lent, two weeks from tomorrow, Lent starts. And I think one of the great things to do is to watch the Passion of mm -hmm. Christ to ex expose those inner thoughts and, and see the suffering of our Lord. But in that movie, you talked about several scenes, but I thought one of the, the, the most uh, touching scenes was when, when the Blessed Virgin Mary goes to Jesus, he's, he's, he's on the way to Calvary, and Jesus tells, him, tells her, see, I make all things new again. And so it, it illustrates the teamwork they had in the, the plan of salvation. They knew it. Mary understood what Jesus was saying. She accepted the plan, even though it cost her all that suffering. Mm -hmm. But Jesus says, yes, I make everything new again. And, and it, it, I think it shows that wonderful understanding between the two, that Mary knows about the plan of salvation, and she willingly 
consents to it, despite the cost to her. That quote is, of course, not from the gospel, but it's quoting the book of Revelation, but perfectly fitting that Jesus would say that, perhaps to his mother. And the other scene that's similar, you notice right after that scene, he gets up, he stands up with his cross, strengthened, consoled, uh, his heart touched with her tender love, but there's another scene where he's actually getting, this is before, where he's getting scourged and he's first whipped um, with these rods, which is extremely painful. And then they bring out the cat of nine tails, the things that's going to actually tear his flesh. And, and of course that uh, terrifies the Blessed Virgin and steals Jesus. But when Jesus sees his mother from the whipping of the rods, he has collapsed on the floor. But then when he sees her, he stands up. And it shows how, how in the midst of his tremendous pain and, and in the face of even worse pain that's about to be visited upon him, unspeakable pain, yet he faces it like a man. And even in his manliness, his manfulness, he is strengthened by, he wants to show his mother, this is what man, manliness looks like. And he's not showing off for her, he's saying, thank you for being here, I'm going to demonstrate what it, what it means to be a man and I'm going to demonstrate how much I love the human race and how much I love my father and uh, and so that I can give myself to my father in this way a way I would not have chosen Jesus is saying but this is what happens when you refuse to work a miracle to save your own skin and you accept the natural consequences of telling the truth and doing good, holy, loving things. Jealous people will beat you and torture you and kill you to get rid of you. That's what he knew he was facing. He did it anyway. And of course, the, the good news is, is that three days later, he's vindicated by rising from the dead. So I'm glad you brought up Lent, Ronnie, because now is the time to sort of prepare for Lent. Yeah, and uh, we can talk about it probably in the upcoming shows, but uh, interesting, you bring up the point about uh, what Jesus did to, to uh, lay bare the thoughts of men, and, mm -hmm. and Lent is really the time to, to do that, to examine our, our inner soul our inner thoughts and see where we are and, and try to push aside the things of this world to uh, engage deeper into the things of God. Well, if you're watching, you can call 337-366-8951 uh, and then dial or press extension 1 and you'll get right through. Ronnie, uh, anything else happening in February? We started a new month. Uh, this is the month dedicated to Catholic schools. Once again, we see Sacred Heart uh, Church in Broussard, a wonderful church. If you haven't been to church in a while and you're looking for a church to go to, uh, be sure and check it out. They have a lot of great things going on. Right to the left of that building is a marvelous school uh, that was established about 100 years ago, St. Cecilia's. But there are a bunch of Catholic schools in town, um, and uh, this is Catholic School Month. You know, Ronnie, I have to say that uh, in many places, um, the public schools, uh, New York and places like that, they're having a fit where the unions won't let the teachers go back to work, but the Catholic schools have been holding class, and um, I wish Donald Trump was still president, if they would have continued, I bet he would have tried to find a way to divert some of the money that's going to pay the salaries of public school teachers who are not working to the, stu to the parents of the students who are sending their kids to class. 
and they're getting the education they're supposed to be getting. But thoughts, Ronnie, about um, the Catholic school system, and, and did you get to go to Catholic school when you were a kid? Great school, I did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where was that, if you mind me asking? Uh, St. Aloysius in Baton Rouge. Okay. Yeah. Um, thoughts about, for our viewers, why they should uh, consider? Um, of course, we'll talk about Catholic schooling, because this is Catholic School Week, but uh, another great option is homeschooling, and there are independent Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. uh, John Paul the Great Academy is a great independent Catholic school, uh, great relations with the diocese, but not uh, they're not a diocesan school like the typical Catholic school is. They have a classical education, a little bit uh, different. But Ronnie, what do you think about uh, Catholic schools? Why should people give it a uh, consideration? Well, you know, in the catechism we learned uh, what is our purpose in life. Our purpose is to know, love, and serve God in order to be with Him in heaven for eternity. And so knowing God is is the first of that process. And so we we need to engage in learning about to know God and school is one of those places and obviously in a public school you're not going to get instruction on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the, the Catholic faith that he came to give us uh, and so forth so you would get that at a private Catholic school and so that is the most important thing to understand and to learn. You know, math is, is important, English, yes, all that's very important, but that won't get you to heaven. Uh, it's, it's our faith, and practicing that faith, and so we, we learn that in those schools. You know, and they have a, a way of bringing the faith into, into English class into math class, into science classes, certainly into history. History is all about uh, our Lord acting in the course of time uh, in, in the events of men. And so, you, you know, we have to understand that, that we have all these opportunities and those opportunities should be uh, used when educating the youth. It reminds me, I think it was, uh, was it Stalin or Lenin who said, give me your youth and in four years, I'll I forget exactly what he said, I'll make them communists never to be lost again. So he understood the, the nature of training someone up in a certain uh, uh, perverse idea. Why not train them up in the idea of God in the way of truth and virtue? You know, Ronnie, the, uh, um, we're blessed in this area so far in our country's history that generally uh, schooling is controlled by local school boards and paid for by local <clears throat> taxes. And so parents have a lot of say in what goes on in public schools and we're blessed in this area to have a great Catholic community and I suspect that in most cases most of the public schools are not guilty of the horrible th most of the public schools in our area and in Louisiana in general are not guilty of the horrible things that are occurring in public schools in California and New York and places where they are ramming down the yeah. throats of children all kinds of sexual ideology uh, gender ideology uh, acceptance of the homosexual lifestyle things that are are horrible mm -hmm. and you do not want your children growing up if if it appears normal to a child then doesn't matter to these people what the bible says that condemns this kind of behavior in yeah. the most striking and vigorous terms but no no longer do some of these uh, school districts politicians believe what God teaches through the right. Bible, through the church, uh, they reject it. They don't come out and say, I reject what the Bible teaches, I reject what God teaches, I reject what the Catholic Church teaches, but that's what they do. Mm -hmm. And they have largely succeeded in intimidating everybody else to thinking that this new way of life is normal. So, uh, I don't see a lot of that uh, happening. There's, most public school teachers in our area are good 
people who even though they can't talk explicitly about God, uh, they still are God-fearing people. However, having said all of that, it's far better to have everything about your curriculum and it's not a false choice between, well, you can learn math and English in a public school and you can learn religion in a Catholic school. No, Catholic schools do just as fine, if not better job, yeah. of teaching the basics, writing, reading, and arithmetic. But, uh, but infusing these things with uh, talk of God, they yeah. usually open and close uh, each one with a prayer. They go as a community to uh, they go as a community to mass. Uh, they usually receive the sacraments mm -hmm. as a group, and this is all very, very, very influential. I was uh, privileged, as as I think you were, Ronnie. Uh, I was able to go eight years to uh, to grade school, to Catholic school, then I went to public school. And uh, immediately I could see the difference, uh, but I'm grateful for the uh, eight years I had in Catholic school uh, for that foundation. I was very, very fond of being there. And so we want to give out a big plug to all the good, all teachers, but especially Catholic school teachers and Catholic schools, and the parents who send their kids to Catholic schools. Final point, Ronnie, this is, uh, this is a a travesty and a tragedy that eventually will um, will uh, expire one day. People don't realize that parents who lovingly and sacrificially send their children to, to Catholic schools are double taxed. They pay taxes like everyone else for the kids who are going to public school and they pay tax for their own kids who do not go to public school, then they have to pay the tuition. And it's a tragedy. Uh, no other industrialized country in the world does that. Canada pays two-thirds out of public funds the cost of Catholic schools. Why? Because they're not prejudiced against Catholics like this country has been for the last hundred years. A lot of that prejudice, thank God, is fading away and they just haven't gotten around to realizing how unfair it is to put that kind of burden on parents. Of uh, Parents have the right to decide where their kids go to school, says the Supreme Court, uh, but they get cheated out of their taxpayer money by not having a fair share going to their own kids. Uh, I think that time will come. Uh, I think if Donald Trump had gotten elected, he would have made progress in that area. If he'd have gotten, um, if his re-election had been recognized, um, but uh, but anyway, we want to uh, stand up for the rights of Catholic parents who sacrificially send their kids to Catholic school, and we want to pray for Catholic schools. Yeah, and I think for those who have to send their kids to public schools, uh, you, you should try to be aware of what is being taught to your children. You may have to unteach them mm -hmm. some of the uh, uh, progressive, shall we say, uh, indoctrination. And with the new administration, I suspect that's going to uh, gain momentum and, and uh, there may be efforts to teach uh, gender confusion and so forth. The people can switch genders and that's okay. And you know, we're seeing a return to the uh, abortion uh, funding and promotion within the federal government and so forth. And, and international. Oh, yeah, with, with taxpayer dollars and, and so forth. So, you know, we're, we're going back into that uh, dark government mode and no telling what kinds of things may be pushed into our public schools. I remember with the Common Core issues, we talked to teachers and some of these teachers were telling us about some of the, the reading materials that were, were horrendous. They were meant to push an agenda, a leftist agenda, anti-Christian leftist agenda, immoral leftist agenda. Now those things are, are likely to come back and, and gain steam. So uh, we all need to be aware of that and we need to raise our voices 
if we see that uh, coming around again. And we need to learn our faith and live our yeah. faith. A lot of people, Ronnie, do not study their faith and they need to. And that's why this show exists, is to try to communicate some of these deeper Catholic truths, which, uh, which are the only opportunity to save our country. Yeah. You know, Ronnie, it's, it's, uh, the battle lines are being drawn. It's been coming for quite a few years, but it's reaching ahead. And it's coming down to black and white. And I mean, those who still are trying to reverence God and obey His holy law and His holy word, and those who have rejected that, you know, we forget about that our very liberal kind of government, and I don't mean Democrat liberal, I mean a government that's not authoritarian to the point of locking people up in the gulags and in the concentration camps and in the torture chambers and those things. Our government has evolved over many, many centuries, but it involved, Ronnie, nowhere else except in Christian lands, in Catholic lands. I'm very fond, I pointed out a few uh, shows ago, about five shows ago, that anytime you look at a picture of the Magna Carta, which is the foundational document which eventually led to various kinds of constitutional government, what you'll see is our bishops forcing the king to sign these limitations on his rights. It was the bishops, the Catholic bishops, who were integral to the formation of this idea that in Christian lands they would not just be ruled by a strong man, by a warlord, by a potentate who has all power and can uh, let people live and die at his own personal whim. No, the, the story of a liberal democracy is the story of many, many centuries of Christianity, of Catholicism, softening, weakening, limiting the power of the king and the premier and the czar and eventually the governors and the presidents and the princes. They, were, they would apply the law also to them. And this was a total gift of the Catholic Church that gradually blossomed into the kind of governments we see, even the Constitution of the United States of America. Not perfect, but a very gradual uh, uh, amalgamation of all of these principles and customs that occurred with Christianity influencing the power of the rulers. And we see this constitution that's rooted in nature and nature's God. It's a very Catholic idea. And, and we see that's been sort of the saving grace of the modern world, is this United States of America preserved from the revolutions that devastated Europe and South America uh, in a, and kind of held on to a kind of government that was rooted in God, godly principles and in the natural law. And Ronnie, this, this life that we now live was intact in the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s even and survived the chaos of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s and so forth down to our day. But now, Ronnie, the Democrat Party has been hijacked by communists. Mm -hmm. They're now the Communist Party, and they already are doing what communists do, which is try to limit free speech, even though it's enshrined in our Constitution that we have freedom of speech, and yet that does not deter them at all. And so we see, Ronnie, these battle lines being drawn, the people who believe God and want to obey God and the people and want to reverence life and reverence uh, innocent life and protect innocent life and those who will allow the murder of babies, the breakup of mama, daddy and the children, 
the promotion of unnatural vice, promiscuity, so that they can make people who ought to be free and self-sufficient dependent upon the government. Why? Because that's how they get their vote, either by a voluntary vote or by stealing the vote. <laughs> and so this party of death and the party of life is what we're seeing. And we have to beg God that he save us from what's these, these, this regime that is now in power. You know, and the other thing is uh, the left will portray the Christians and the conservatives as the haters, mm -hmm. but really it's the other way around. We're the lovers. We love people enough to tell them the truth. They're the ones who hate. They're the ones who want to destroy people who have different ideas. You look at what they do. They want to take away our rights, and, and they're working through big tech mm. so that they can supposedly keep their hands clean, but they get big tech to censor uh, our rights of speech. We can't put out certain ideas. Uh, their websites get shut down. They, they say we're haters if we oppose uh, homosexual unions or uh, gender switching and so forth. We don't hate. We, we love people enough to tell them the truth. Their behavior indicates that they are the haters, and yet they turn that around. And what's it's tragically funny <clears throat> is that they claim to be scientific, mm -hmm. and nothing is more scientific than nothing is more scientific than a boy and a girl X chromosome on a, on a thousand yeah. points right. of proof. Yeah. Thank you so much for calling. Well, to thank you guys for the show and tell you you're the harbingers of truth in a world that's going crazy with immorality. This is terrible. But the guns have taken over the whole country. Very few people to fight back with, even with words. You, you're still doing very few that have the nerve and the intelligence and the love for mankind to do what you're doing. God bless you all. Goodbye. Thank wow. You. Thank you. You're very kind. And uh, with that, if you'd like to call 337-366-8951, then dial extension 1. Um, Ronnie, people need to speak up. They need to learn their faith, and then they need to spread it because the enemies of Jesus, and that's what it is. You know, there's this great scene, what communists always do. The, the, the liberals in this country treated religion with respect for a long time, but eventually push comes to shove, and as communists always do, there was a scene that shocked the world. I mean, not just the communists in Mexico in the 1920s hanging priests and nuns, but the uh, communists in Spain hanging priests and nuns in the 1930s yeah. and burning churches to the ground. And there's this famous scene, hold on just for a minute, caller, of these communist punks machine gunning a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now who would do that? Well, people who hate religion yeah. would. Yeah. Thank you so much for calling. Oh, hi, thank you for the show. Um, you know, I, I don't want to take our the, the common people off the hook because we all have to speak out. But uh, where are our church leaders? I can't believe it has gotten this far mm -hmm. that the progress that's been made by the other side, and especially just in the last few years, it's, it's really been shocking. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, we shouldn't feel fear in our hearts, but it's been frightening. Yeah. And I would hope that I just don't see a, the leadership uh, in the Christian community as a whole, Catholic or Protestant, mm -hmm. really standing up in the breach with what's going on right now. Uh, they've, been, they've been cowed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they're demoralized, but that maybe takes me off the hook. <laughs> I don't know, but things are not good. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm going to let you go ahead and finish. I'm going to hang up. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the call. Ronnie, he brings up an important point. Um, 
I, I think back when I was a kid, and you know you're getting old when you start telling stories about when you were a kid, but Father Brandley, God rest his soul, a La Salette priest in Sulphur, Louisiana, I guess he died about 30 or 40 years ago, but when I was a kid, he would slam anything like that. If he could have been frozen in time and would come on the scene today, he probably would have had a heart attack from the, he wouldn't believe it, mm -hmm. but he would be at the pulpit slamming his fist, telling the truth, and with his voice trembling and yeah. shaking with passion. Um, and there are good priests giving great homilies. I, I showed pictures of two, um, Father White and Father Delcom in Sacred Heart. They give some splendid homilies. But this requires a tremendous amount of courage. Most are still speaking about love in an ephemeral kind of way, not realizing the house is burning down mm -hmm. everywhere. And none of this could have happened. You know, in the 1940s, when, when Roosevelt 